Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the next session. Um, what we're going to talk about in this session is that we're going to have an insightful conversation and open debate with regarding to the future of supply chain and how supply chain has increased uh, based upon what's happened in uh, 2020. So first and foremost, we'll start off ladies first. So Carmen, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Kurt. Good morning to everyone. I am uh, Carmen Vidal. I am the Chief Procurement Officer in NG Middle East. I've been here for more than 15 years and with NG 12. For those that they don't know, NG, we are the number one, uh, the first independent water and uh, electricity producer in, uh, in the GCC. And we also have solutions. We're also very engaged in the zero carbon transition. Thank you, Zaid. Welcome, Zaid. Hi, hi, Kurt. Hi, thank you for having me here. Thank you also for the organizer for the organizers to have me. My name is uh, Saeed Al Ghafri. I'm the Chief uh, Supply Chain and Planning Officer in Emirates Team. Welcome. So, Mohammed. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mohammed Habib. I am the Vice President of Supply Chain Management at Debreed. We provide uh, district cooling services uh, mainly in the UAE and got a large footprint in the region as well. And uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. My question. Saurabh. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Saurabh Mishra. I am the general manager for supply chain in Petronash. We manufacture oil and gas field equipments for most of the oil companies in the uh, Middle East and globally as well. So we supply directly products to the Adnox, the Aramcos, the PDO, the KOCs. And we have operations in uh, Saudi as well as in uh, UAE. Well, welcome. And last but not least, Shannon. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Shannon Hoare. I'm the Senior Vice President for Procurement and Logistics at Abu Dhabi Airport. Abu Dhabi Airport uh, operates uh, five airports across the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, uh, with the largest and, and most prominent being Abu Dhabi International, uh, the second largest uh, airport in uh, the United Arab Emirates. Well, welcome everybody. So we've got a, a great panel here from across lots of different industries and everything else. So the first question I've got to the panel is, how did 2020 affect your business? And I think we'll go straight to Shannon because that's probably been one of the biggest hits. So Shannon, how did 2020 affect uh, Abu Dhabi airports? Yeah, uh, so that, that's a big question to answer. I think um, uh, it would be fair to say that uh, aviation sector, uh, travel and tourism has been significantly affected by COVID, um, both in, in economic terms, uh, but also in, in terms of operational impact and the impact to our workforce. Um, you know, I think it's no secret that um, uh, the ability for individuals to travel has been uh, significantly impaired. Uh, and so what effectively have we have seen for uh, the, certainly in the initial uh, early phases of the impact of the pandemic uh, was aviation effectively shut down, uh, certainly for, for passenger travel. Um, for cargo shipments, uh, we, in actual fact, we saw an increase in cargo shipments. So there were still airplanes in the skies and, and uh, airport operators were still processing, um, you know, aircrafts and aircraft movements. But most of that was, as I mentioned, uh, cargo related. And then later that, that shifted into uh, a focus on repatriation and and uh, you know, assisting uh, families to be reunited and, and getting people to their home countries. And, um, and, and really that, that's been the, the nature of things uh, up until recent times um, where uh, each country and uh, the challenges that they each face in, in ensuring that the right protocols are applied to control uh, the impact of the pandemic um, uh, you know, it, it affects the ability for people to travel. And I guess in a lot of ways, the willingness for, for people to travel, uh, wanting to make sure that the, the, the travel environment is safe and secure. It's created some significant challenges in the way in which um, um, airport operates, the airports operate in terms of uh, how uh, uh, social distancing uh, challenges are met, 
uh, in the past, airports were uh, very focused on uh, maximising the the uh, experience for passengers. So reducing dwell time and queues and these kinds of things where these days there's more checkpoints, there's more, more um, you know, controls being applied just to make sure that the travellers who are boarding airplanes are safe and, and uh, are not um, adding to the com complex problem that uh, we're, we're dealing with on a global scale. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Now that leads us nicely then into the back the supply chain side. So because we know we've heard with regards to what's happened with the airline business and everything else. So Zaid, how did um, 2020 or how is 2020 affecting your supply chain? Yeah, uh, 2020, Kurt, was uh, very, very rough year, I have to say. Uh, there has been a lot of learnings, I would say, although it was rough, but we have learned a lot. There has been so many changes happening that we wanted to see uh, that we wanted to see it before, but 2020 made it possible. Uh, you know, uh, it's no secret, but there has been a global uh, decline in growth, not only in the UAE, but there, there has been a global decline in growth. There has been changes in the mobility of the people, urbanization and so on. You, we've seen lockdowns. Uh, there has been also change in inter international trade. So these all, I mean, affected, they affected all the sectors and they affected uh, Emirates Steel is no, uh, no different than the others. Now, uh, in Emirates Steel, to be completely honest with you, uh, it was very tough. I mean, we basically started the... Uh, in, in January, testing, uh, testing, the, testing what's happening, looking at what's happening in the world. And we've seen it slowly. And that basically built up by the end of January. Then, you know what? All the strategies we have put in place did not work. So we had to change. So, okay. what, so basically, we, 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 we've seen how, how resilient is our supply chain. How, how resilient it can, it can it recover quick? What are the gaps in it? And trust me, there has been a lot that we have learned and we are moving away with, uh, with good stuff like that. Now, there has been difficulties in the beginning to start working from, from home, but eventually I think people adapted and that was key in our, uh, uh, in, in, in our success in 2020. It was challenging, but it was, it was also key. What we have done, we've looked at the spend, we've tightened the spend, and basically we've, we've, uh, we've seen that these are, there are key elements that we can do in the short term to ensure that we sustain our businesses. Great. Okay, so based upon that, we've talked about resilience and everything else, which is really interesting. So, sorry, how, how have you coped with regarding to 2020? And you mentioned earlier offline that you've still got stuff stuck in the UK. Yeah. So, Kurt, I would put it in this way that if I have a power of selective amnesia, I would like to forget the first year of uh, first six months of uh, this year. I mean, we were under serious trouble during uh, March, April, and May because being in an oil and gas business, uh, predominantly my supply chain, although it is very diverse, based out of Europe, India, as well as China, but unfortunately, all the three regions were into a lockdown. So, in the month of March, April, and May, there were serious and very critical components stuck, which were directly impacting oil and gas production, both for Saudi Aramco as well as Adno. So it was a tough time, but it was managed somehow with absolute close collaboration with suppliers. So it has a severe impact and we are in principle getting ready mentally and also operationally for the second wave because we are trying to see the Tides are turning back again, and especially a lot of my supply chain in China and India, once the festive seasons are over, we are expecting rise in cases again and a second round of disruption. So touch wood and keeping our finger crossed, we are in uh, bracing for impact again. Okay, great. So Carmen, is, um, what about in your industry? What's, what's happened with you with regard to 2020 and COVID and all these changes and legislation changes and different countries coming in and going out of lockdown. How has that all affected your supply chain? Okay, so yes, 2020 has been a challenge for everyone. I think that uh, there are two different things that I would say in our favor is that NGS and international groups. So we were in contact with our Chinese colleagues 
and we took from the return on experience that they had. So we actually, regarding PPE, we were very well placed. We reacted um, before anybody else and we never had an issue with PPE, which is critical because we need people on the field to maintain and operate. Remember that we deliver potable water and electricity. Um, so that's one of the things. The second thing is that we already have um, business continuity plans in place for critical suppliers. So I think that uh, uh, what we had really to strengthen, it was the communication, the sharing, so in terms of uh, the stocks. Uh, the supplier relationship management was very, very strong on two cases. One of them, it was on, uh, on products uh, that they go over the borders because the borders were closed. So we had to go into trying to reactivate local suppliers. We increased the stocks of material, just to give you an idea. At some point, we had more than 20,000 metric tons of chemicals across the region on stock, which is, which is enormous. But that's what we had to do. Is that okay if, if, uh, if Bahrain closes uh, or Kuwait closes, you know, the, the, the causeway? How are we going to do it? Qatar being also an issue because uh, the, the logistics in Qatar were complicated. So we revamped that uh, very fast. And I would say that the problem that it still subsists and that we have is the movement of experts that we need for the maintenance of, of gas turbines and control systems. So there, what we do is um, we have a strengthening the relationship with the key OEMs to make sure that we do have a very good relationship that we put in place remote uh, support uh, solutions. And also to tell to the, to, the, to the suppliers is that we are on this together. So if you have see an issue, you see a risk, let us know as soon as you identify, let's find a solution together. So in some cases it has been moving mindfulness of big machines. Of course, we do have impact on, on costs, okay? Um, but um, so far, I'm going to say so good because we still have we still have issues and i'm going to say not only here but also in europe because they have established quarantines in europe no uh, not in england <laughs> <laughs> well there, there might be other countries that uh, <laughs> yes yeah, uh, um uh, one of the things that we have been working with the main oems and i think is, is the topic is about localization is how we can bring on the long term some of that expertise permanently into the region so do they have if i can interrupt there that's really good and which leads us on really so mohammed taking up on what carmen has said there and everybody else how is uh, the sips professionals added to added value to the organization over the last 12 months because of covid so so how is you know the sips professionals in, in your team and everything else okay use their expertise with regard into the last 12 months so one thing before answering your question, as CIPS as an organization, I have been affiliated with them since 2006, 2007 time period. So I know the kind of value they bring in. Uh, I think the, the, the biggest impact CIPS has on the procurement professionals is to give them the, uh, the exposure they require, uh, the, the set of uh, principles, methodologies and frameworks they need to think in a different way. So I'm, I'm a big uh, proponent and I encourage my team members to take on the CIPS certification courses and programs whenever they can. But at the same time, uh, CIPS uh, with their vast network of professionals in the region, they conduct uh, multiple networking sessions. And those were the ses sessions that I found extremely beneficial in exchanging the experiences and the challenges we normally face to try to get the solutions we can. That's um, great. But what about procurement and supply chain adding value to your organization over the last 12 months? So, you know, the, the, your, your team, how is it added value? You know, we've got all these risks, which Carmen was talking about. We've got Shannon with regarding to airports. We've got Sarab with regarding to, you've got stuff stuck in, in the UK. I'd love to bring it over for you, but I can't get a plane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so how is, how is procurement and supply added value to the organization? Well, in, in the case of procurement supply, uh, to say that COVID-19 was a challenge uh, is an understatement. Um, it was a massive, massive disruption across the businesses um, everywhere. And it, it was something that us as a professional specialists and, and, and experienced uh, professionals normally plan for ahead in time. But to have everything go wrong at one place at one time was, was something of a significant value. 
Um, within procurement supply chain, initially what we did uh, wa was to put up uh, certain programs and plans. Uh, we call it COVID-19 response plan. And that helped us uh, identify the key stakeholders within the organizations like operations and, uh, and maintenance people, finance, IT, legal. Because when the COVID-19 hit, uh, the biggest, I think, uh, confusion was, is it a force majeure? We don't know. Because the UAE code of 1985, if I'm not mistaken, uh, does not really have any uh, specific definitions of an epidemic or, or, or epidemics being part of the, uh, the force majeure. So we had to go back and look at all the contracts. Now, obviously, that plan had multiple points in it. Uh, like Carmen said, we proactively approached our OEM, our suppliers, to, to, to ensure that we have the, uh, the security of supplies that we needed. But I think more importantly, internally speaking, uh, it gave um, our people a different mindset internally within procurement, within the supply chain management, and across the management. Uh, and one of the things that we that we realized and we recognized early on was that we have stakeholders that we can rely on. Uh, people like, uh, in Tabit's case, we have Mubadra and NG as our two biggest stakeholders. Uh, you know, we can always uh, reach them uh, and, and, and get in touch with them to combine our consolidated planning, for example. So in case with Carmen, uh, right away, we, we got in touch with Carmen and NG, we, we uh, consolidated our PPE requirements, and we, 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 we were completely fine in terms of the security of supply. And, and management, I think, has appreciated what we were able to do so quickly uh, to ensure that everything is coming on board on time, the inventories were, were pretty stocked, in fact, we increase our buffers slightly uh, in close collaboration with finance <laughs> to ensure that we have uh, what we need when we need them. And to be being part of the critical infrastructure, um, just like power, water, uh, you know, people can't go without district cooling. So we have to make sure that we we had our services delivered to clients at all times. I think, uh, you know, if, if I can just build on that. Um... Just stop you a minute, Shannon, two seconds. Ladies and gentlemen listening in, um, please put your questions down. I've just checked to see if there's any questions for the panel. Okay, just pop that in to some questions. All right, and then we'll have some time at the end of the session to bring those into the panelists. Shannon, I apologize. Over to you, sir. That's okay. I, I was just uh, going to build on the comments from Mohammed and, and, and say, you know, I think one of the things that, that definitely has been apparent uh, throughout this year is the, the, the demand on procurement and supply chain uh, to uh, assist and, and um, facilitate the, the actions that are needed in, in the business in terms of sustainability, uh, continuity, uh, mitigating the, the disruption in the supply chain. Uh, all of these things really have landed on the, on the procurement and supply chain professionals to, to pursue. So one, it's done some, some um, very important uh, positive uh, improve, improvement in the profile for, for this uh, part of uh, the business activities. Uh, but also, you, you know, I guess it's allowed us to draw on uh, experience, uh, you know, where, where we've got a lot of depth in, in business understanding within procurement and supply chain organisations, uh, which sometimes, um, you know, can, can not get the recognition it deserves, I guess. And, and now these things are bubbling to the surface. Um, and then also with the technical skills that, that um, ha have been brought into into this uh, segment of business activity over over years through support from SIPs and, and, and other other areas of professional development, uh, the calibre of people, uh, the the the, uh, the strength of their experience and, and skills definitely has, has played a big part. I, that has definitely been the case for our organisation, uh, and I know from from talking to colleagues and friends in uh, in procurement and supply chain, it's a, it's a similar picture across most organisations. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. If I can add on what just Channel said, is that uh, uh, we have seen some people really bright at uh, a lot of coordination with operations and maintenance. And I think that for the future, we'll have to rethink some of the, the sk traditionally skills that we see in our people. So I am absolutely with you uh, in much more digital and uh, how do we relate to the business? Because we have much more visibility. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So we've had all these issues. You've talked about the, the benefits now with the six professionals and how um, we're adding value and everything else. But we've still got this problem. We've got the COVID, we've got Brexit, which is going to affect. We're not sure about that. 
Uh, we've got the US elections, we've got issues in different trade wars and everything else. So what risk mitigation strategies are you thinking about now based upon what you've learned in 2020 to go forward? So Sharab, what, what risk mitigation strategies are you starting to think about? I mean, the, looking at what is happening globally, I think the whole globe as well as the region is kind of going through a metamorphosis as, term, as far as their strategy and their uh, business relationship globally is going on. So we are actively working towards de-risking our supply chains for by trying to develop as much as supplies locally. Now, that is not a near-term solution, but more of a long-term solution over the period of one, two or three years, where we want to bring around 30 to 40% of our supplies mandatory within UAE or within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. When I talk, I talk because since we being an oil and gas company, we are absolutely driven by the ICV, that is in-country value-add initiative by the Adna group of companies, as well as the program of Iktawa, which is driven in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And what we are seeing is this is being more and more put together tomorrow. Maybe Kuwait would also like to come with, uh, with a similar program. So we are trying to bring in suppliers and trying to develop suppliers within uh, the region. And also another benefit, which it is more likely to give us is it will generate a lot of cash within our operations. Because as long as I'm dependent on my suppliers in Europe and China and all the day I pick up the material, I owe them. But whereas if my suppliers are available locally, say in UAE or uh, Saudi, I can generate that 30 to 45 days of additional cash for the operations. And as it goes, cash is king and will remain king at least in the next two or three years where there is going to be a severe cash and uh, credit crunch in the market. So this is these are That's interesting. Taking if I can interrupt you there, because I'm tired. I want to make sure we get everybody a voice. Zaid, you're manufacturing. So what are you doing as well with regard to manufacturing to counteract you know your risks going forward yeah so uh, when you look at uh, us in manufacturing i mean there are three main components so the sources manufacturing and then the customer so during this covid-19 this the there has been a lot of stress on these three components now uh, from a risk management I don't think risk, the risks changed. The risks are, I think to me, they are the same, but now it's basically possible to happen. So we need to, to, we need to react quickly to it. For example, we always knew that we need to diversify our sources. We always knew that. Now we have to do it or else we, sh we shut down. So basically from a manu manufacturing point of view, uh, when I look at the, the uh, our at our at our, at our current strategies, we look at our risk basically register, and the ones that pops up into my mind today is the talent engagement, because today with this COVID nineteen and people working at home, there is big pressure on people, and uh, and uh, throughout at least the past six or seven months, we relied a lot on people to drive things. I mean, I, I'm just gonna capitalize on what my colleagues have said coordinating with operation, coordinating with sales, coordinating with customers, speaking to this guy, speaking to me. So there is a there is big pressure on the people. So I think engagement, a very, 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 a very important engagement strategy is key uh, for this to happen. Mohammed mentioned something about uh, our current stakeholder. I mean, uh, we really uh, have to be very close. We need to work very closely with our government. We need to look at what projects they have in the pipeline. How can we add value? Because this really pro this problem taught us that we can control things within ourselves. But something like you know Brexit, the U.S. election, I cannot control that. So basically, we need to work on the the strength we have within our within our hand, which is the government. And that's why the stakeholder engagement is very important. These are two things that comes into my mind right now. That's interesting. So what's coming out um, in our discussion here is we've got a lot of soft skills are starting to come out. We've got the technical skills and everything else, but what's, what we've shown then is with the supply chain in 2020 and everything else, the soft skills have been so important, the stakeholder management, vendor management, you know, interaction, as, as you just said, Zaid, and everything else. 
what about understanding the risks? What about tiering in supply chain? So Carmen and, and Shannon, what, what do you think about the tiering side of supply chain, identifying the risks? Um, I think that it's a key, uh, and, and, and in certain measure, everyone does the first analysis in terms of my supply, where are my risks? What we have seen is with the COVID-19 uh, is that does my supplier know the supply chain? And I think that that's the question. I, I, I strongly believe that uh, maybe two, three years down the road, we're going to have issues with the small components, very specific, very specialized, most probably electronics, whereas most suppliers, they have uh, disappeared today or, or the expertise has disappeared. So that's uh, in sense of the risk mitigation, something that we're going, that we have started to do, and we're going to keep doing is ensuring that all suppliers, they know their supply chain. And we have an example with Turkey and KSA at the moment, uh, where we have been in contact with the main OEMs, and actually we have had an issue with the import of material from Turkey into KSA, and the OEM didn't know it, because their supplier was importing it. So I, I think that, that there is a lot to be done there. Um, and having said this, I think that there is also a way of trying to see where can we partner with those OEMs to develop more in-country expertise, whether it's manufacturing or, or, or not, that to have it closer. Uh, because sometimes the supply chains, that, as you said, the tier two, tier three, might be really too far uh, from, from what we buy. So that's definitely an action that we are taking in-house. So yeah, just, just to keep up, I'm just going to interrupt you again, Shannon. So I've been on to the questions, everybody, and so far I've only received two questions for the panel. So please, if you've got questions for the panel, type them in so that we can answer those questions during the session. Shannon, please. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, I, I was just going to build on Carmen's uh, comment there. I think, you know, um, the, the traditional approach to uh, the, the development of, of risk registers, the identification of risks and mitigating those um, in the past took on a particular form, but I think um, with everything that we've experienced this year, uh, one of the things that we have learned is our traditional approach to uh, reviewing risks and developing risk res registers and uh, having all of those detailed plans was not sufficient for uh, the, the experience that we've, we've uh, been through so far this year. And so we had to move very, very quickly to, to better understand and, and take actions where it was needed, right? And, and in areas which um, we, we didn't, you know, we're not in our, our realm of thinking previously. Simple things like um, in the past, we had a readily available workforce, uh, you know, whether that was our direct employee base or through uh, service partners. Um, but in reality, with the impact of the, the pandemic, we really haven't had the same level of, of confidence in the availability of that workforce. Uh, certain actions might be taken and you might lose uh, a workforce of 100 people just simply through, through um, um, you know, uh, prevention of, of, of any transmission um, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, in some, in some, some cases, in those critical, critical areas of activity, we brought that workforce into our property, kept them, um, you know, in accommodation, in our site, uh, and so they could live and work within the airport environment, not uh, traveling outside, just to ensure that we were able to continue our operations in these, th these critical parts of activity. So we, we wouldn't have built that into our planning previously. We've had to act very quickly. We've had to think outside the box, um, you know, and, and that, that's a very localized solution, you know, in terms of what can we do within the, um, the, the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, or more broadly speaking, from a, a UAE perspective, to ensure that we can continue business uh, uninterrupted and, and, and not effectively shut the airport down because uh, we can't get people to uh, conduct fire uh, protection services, for example. Great point. So we've got a question here. So how do you see the, the VUCA affecting the supply chain in the GCC? So come on then. Yeah, go for I, it then. I would definitely, definitely like to answer that. I mean, especially when working in both 
kingdom of saudi arabia and uh, uae i mean there is a lot of uh, uncertainty and absolutely low visibility that what are going to be the policies and the import regulations in the next 6 to 7 months in the month of july all of a sudden within a week time duties were increased around 10 to 15% in uh, saudi arabia and also new import formalities for saso and saber were reported into place so practically within a matter of 15 days my complete supply chain was crippled my 30 to 40% of my workforce was emptying because most of the raw material was stuck in customs so it's really important for all of us the fraternity and everyone to kind of have forums where we can discuss things and be prepared about share information that some sometimes somebody know what coming down the train or what's at the end of the pipeline so at least most of the people are able to understand what's coming and brace for impact and prepare ourselves so i would say it is a very very important thing very relevant and happening as we talk okay mohammed what, what what's your thoughts i think with in terms of volatility uncertainties complexities and ambiguity they will always remain here with new and new you know different uh, challenges that come to us whether it's uh, from far afield or nearby. I think, uh, I think in terms of, and I would, I would resonate what uh, my colleague Shannon mentioned, uh, these risks w will be there. They will just change the form slightly and we need to be prepared uh, more internally than outward thinking is how we can become a bit more agile to respond to them and to adapt uh, to begin with. Uh, because if, if we are still working with the, within the same structure of rigid policies and procedures with IT that's completely outdated, people, people uh, and, and team members who are not up to date with the current methods of doing uh, supply chain management, then there's a very little way that you can, you can successfully um, overcome these challenges. Interesting. So there's a, there's a question from Lokesh, which is basically saying, how can digitalization help us better prepare for something like a pandemic and, and supply chain? So how can digitalization help us in supply chain? So I'm going to ask Saeed to kick us off on this one. Digitalization, do you think that's going to help us? Absolutely. <laughs> Though, uh, if you ask me, answer, then. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me back in December, I will tell you I have no clue what the digitization is. Uh, uh, but I think now, go to anyone in the business, they will tell you, okay, we know it. We know basically we know it. But now the difficulty is. Uh, digitization requires uh, intelligence and it requires uh, knowledge management. Uh, why? Because it basically helps, it should help the, the expertise within the business react faster. I'll just give you an example. So today, if I have a tool, for example, which can articulate a specific order within two minutes, see how diff how, how, what's the difference between a two minutes and a two days to make a decision. That's basically the power of uh, digitization. And uh, I think now in Emirates Steel, we, are basic, we have established a specific vertical just on digitization because we, wanna, we want to invest in it. And the components of that uh, today, we have a knowledge management function that only focus on knowledge management and knowledge retention. And then basically we are encouraging the people to come up with, you know, creative, with creative ideas, innovative ideas, and, uh, uh, and again, that will build on what we're currently doing, which is something that I'm leading in Emirates T. We're basically trying to have a com the complete supply chain under one function, just to ensure that there is a specific co coordination between the people. And my God, the number of tools that we are putting in place to help us with decision makings uh, and all that shows that digitization is something that uh, key for, uh, for any businesses going forward. Okay, very good. Okay, so I've got a question that came through and it's, it's quite a large question, so I'll break it down. And basically it's, it's the, the, the adoption of automated uh, service uh, automation um, and the adoption of AI within supply chain. So the adoption of, of more AI. We talked about digitalization, but more AI. So who wants to, who wants to have a go at that with regarding to answering the, the adoption of AI? Maybe I can uh, go on. Uh, I can contribute to this. Yeah. 
Um, if you have a look at your supply chain operations today and you try to identify where most of your people are, are putting their time, uh, the eight or nine hours that they have in a day, and you, you're going to realize that a lot of these people are putting time in the transactions management, right? So they are data entry. There's a lot of information that they need to uh, progress through screens to issue the purchase order. There's a lot of coordination that's done on emails. And the idea really is how can we, as, as, as procurement leaders, help our team members uh, automate things. So a lot of the things that could be left to computers, to systems to do, uh, should be outsourced to the systems. And people should be put to better use of uh, better in creating intelligence, staying in closer touch and, and managing supplier relations, uh, um, assisting the management with decision making. And, and that's where the value uh, should be. Uh, and, and that's what we are seeing now with uh, a recent report by McKinsey a couple of months ago, where they interviewed 800 odd executives across 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 the world, um, majority of them, around 85%, said it's uh, the, the whole idea around acceleration of digitization is you know, a direct result of the team. So uh, more and more companies are now giving a lot of putting a lot of effort in moving to digitizing their information, adding automation, uh, using robotic processes, for example. Uh, to outsource uh, transactions, which otherwise is of very little value. That's a, that's fantastic. So we're we're running out of time here, and one of the things I want to think about is the future. And we're coming out of um, hopefully COVID, and there's more vaccines that have been announced now, and hopefully we'll, you know, we'll be traveling around and the free movement of goods and everything else. So where do you see? 2021, based upon what we've learned from 2020, where do you see the future now of uh, SIPs, obviously, procurement and, uh, you know, and supply chain? But where do you actually see the, the balance between procurement and supply chain in the future? So, Shannon, where, where do you see the, the future now? Uh, so, I, I think that there's going to be uh, a continued focus for sure in, in procurement and supply chain. Uh, as businesses look to um, uh, climb out of the difficult year of 2020, um, th there's still a lot of uncertainty on what 2021 will bring and, and the extent to which we see recovery uh, in, in each sector. Um, and so, you know, I think mostly right now, businesses are being quite cautious in their outlook towards 2021. I guess in some ways, depending on your sector, but um, and so the the reliance within the organisation, from what I am seeing, is uh, a, a continued focus, and and so looking at how the the procurement organisation can continue to drive uh, financial value, uh, how the supply chain teams are uh, optimising the the uh, the supply chains, whether they be local or uh, international and, and striking the right balance between between those two scenarios. Um, uh, you know, so I think those things are going to continue to be a focus, definitely uh, on my side. Um, and, and so what that means is the, the strength of the team, the capabilities, skills, the, the, the experience are continued to be sought after. And one of the things that we are seeing is many people in my organisation are being sought for advice and input and involvement in projects because the business leaders are seeing them as critical enablers for, um, you know, for future impact. Uh, as, as we launch projects today, they are for uh, impact in 2021 largely. And, and, uh, and so we have a very big year in front of us as an airport next year. Uh, and this will continue to be the case uh, as we move forward. Great. So, um, Saeed, what do you think is going to happen in the future for us? Uh, okay, I, I think uh, I, I, I completely agree with Shannon on the, on the horizon of uh, 2021. Looking at what we see in front of us, it's going to be definitely better than 2020. <laughs> so forecast is good. So, uh, we should all be, I mean, uh, looking, uh, we should all look for the, for, for the positive side of this. And hopefully, I, I think we'll be able to get over 2020. Now, uh, there has been, a, as I mentioned, there has been a lot of learnings from 2020. I mean, we, we've been challenging ourselves to do 
ways, specific things in our own way. But in 2020, we've seen people challenging just the way they're doing stuff. And that has stimulated different ideas, different risks, different strategies. So based on that, uh, 2021, we will basically have to work long term and challenge each and every step within the supply chain. We, you never know. We may have a third wave, a, th a fourth wave. We need to have different options. We need to basically ensure that our supply chain is resilient as much as possible because that's not going to be the end of it. I mean, every year, basically, when I start the year, I say this year will be better. This year will be better. Trust me, every year has a different dynamics. The, uh, we are basically in the UAE, but the UAE is part of a global uh, uh, play, playground. Uh, so we need to basically focus on our strategies, build more uh, thinking process, and ensure that uh, we have those uh, laid down for 2021. Excellent. Shrab. To okay. add to what uh, Mr. Said said, what, how we are looking at 2021 is as an organization, we are planning to focus more on uh, supply relationship management in the year 2021. Because what we have realized is only very minute level collaboration with the suppliers was enabling us to come out of difficult situation in the first uh, two quarters of uh, 2020. So thing which have really worked taken out of very difficult and tricky situation in the past will continue to do so in the future also. So we are going to focus on supply relationship management. We are going to focus on collaboration between our stakeholders and our suppliers directly so that they also understand each other's uh, language. They also understand the situation. And we are trying to use a lot of technology and a digital transformation initiative to bring the suppliers into our system and also open some part of our system to the suppliers so that they also have a visibility. So this is where we are planning to be in 2020. Okay, right. So um, time is of the essence. So um, I'm going to have to speed you up a bit now. Sorry about that. So um, Carmen, where do you see 2021 and onwards? I think that 2021 is going to remain, at least for the first six months, complicated until we do have a permanent solution for the COVID. And in all case, as I mentioned, the, the movement of people is key. So that remains a still a certain. I, um, the way that I see it is that uh, procurement and supply chain, uh, we have a lot of visibility now. I think that we have a great opportunity to uh, stay visible to the management and show how we bring added value. So that's going to be my target for next year. Uh, stay visible, keep working on, uh, keep putting in practice things that we have already done during the COVID, working closer with operations and with maintenance, um, that, that's key. Now I'm going to say I'm going to be a little bit tricky. Um, uh, we're going to look into localization, but I'm going to try to use it because in NG we do have, uh, starting next year, we will start measuring CO2 for suppliers. So I think that localization is going to be a key lever uh, to reach some of the targets that we have. Excellent. So, <laughs> Mohammed, I love that uh, just little snippet you brought in there. So, Mohammed, what about what's going to happen in 2021? Where, where are we going to be? After 2020, Kurt, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the plans and projections we had of 20 uh, that we had created in 2019 were put to test in 2020. But nevertheless, I think uh, we are human beings. We find a way to grow. We find a way to adapt to things and, and challenge ourselves, like Said mentioned. Um, we will find a way. Uh, things will, uh, there seem to be good news uh, around the corner with vaccinations coming through. Um, yes, there's going to be a little bit of uncertainty around a few things. But uh, as long as organizations have plans, as long as they're ready to take on uh, different challenges of different sorts, and they remain adaptable and agile internally, uh, we're gonna we're gonna we can counter any of those uh, particular uh, complications. There's a really interesting question that's came up, and that was basically many companies are suppliers, risks, tools, etc., and third party suppliers. Um, so they're third party people doing risk analysis and everything else on suppliers. Um, how how much do we rely on that, and should we rely on third party people? 
doing our risk. Now, very quickly now, um, if you could answer that one, Shannon. Um, I think um, so. It's, it's an interesting question. I think that the risk, uh, the identification of risk and the ownership of the risks uh, definitely for me resides within the organisation. But sometimes uh, getting uh, a, a, an a independent perspective um, can highlight gaps or or topics that perhaps you were blind to. So, right? so they're very helpful in identifying blind spots and, and to be able to help draw out your thinking in those areas. Sometimes you get a little bit stuck in your own internal view of things and, and don't always get an opportunity to balance that with a, a more independent perspective. So, uh, you know, I'm an, I'm an advocate of having that as a support element, uh, but obviously for me, um, the, the ownership, identification, management of uh, risks and, and mitigation strategies, business continuity plans really, um, uh, for me, lie within the organisation. Okay, very interesting. Okay, so we've gone through and we've talked now about cr uh, critical enablers, how procurement supply chain people have been seen now as critical enablers, and that was Shannon shared that. We talked about the soft skills, a lot about vendor management, a lot about strategic alliance, okay, and resilience. The one thing Mohammed talked about is his plans in 2019 for his supply chain strategy, and everything else was gone. Okay, so we're now having to reinvent the wheel. So part of, of, of us being, you know, a strategic enabler, and very quickly answer this one, please, is, and I know a lot of you are at board positions and everything else, but do you think there's going to be an increase of, more board positions for CPO, C, uh, Chief Supply Chain Officers within organisations within the MENA region because of COVID? Do you think we're going to get more, more visibility and more strategic focus? If I can speak from my perspective, uh, you know, I think this year as an example, um, I've had more uh, engagement with questions from challenge from um, and, and a pursuit of, of alternate options or, or you know, strategies that, that allow for smooth business continuity with board, uh, with board members, with our chairman than ever before. And, and so I think, you know, board members are, are in the detail. This, for, for what I'm seeing this year, they're definitely in the, the detail. They're, they're concerned and involved in the performance of the business. Um, and, and so, um, and I think this is a thing that goes to the, the impact of uh, profile for the procurement supply chain professionals. It, it definitely does uh, create the opportunity to advocate more uh, of, of those scenarios into the future. It builds confidence in boards, gets them to understand that the calibre of people who, who operate in this space and, and therefore contribute to uh, these discussions in a meaningful way for board members. So, yeah, I, I, it's definitely something that I have experienced this year. And, and uh, you know, based on what I'm seeing at the moment, I don't think that that will, will, uh, will reduce in the, in the near term. Anyone else? Carmen. Yes, okay. Um, yes, okay. So f for me, I have to say that I agree with uh, with Shannon. We, as I said, we have the opportunity. We need to grab it, okay? I don't think that anybody's going to give us uh, uh, because I have done all this. I think that it's up to us to, to show it and ask for it. Um, the other thing that we have done, and I think that this what, what changed the perception is that we have been a key enabler in either containing costs or reducing reducing costs in a situation where most of us, we also have a loss of revenues. So the, the fact that the companies, they stay there, they have stayed, we have been a, a big contributor. And, and, and I think it's going to change the perception of some of the management that we are not an administrative function, we are an operational function contributing to the business. But once again, Kurt, I think that we have to grab the opportunity. Nobody's going to give it to us. They will have to to make the space for procurement at those type of uh, committees in, uh, in, in, um, in the steering um, uh, bodies, government okay. bodies. So I think that it would be up to us. But I see that the opportunity is there. Fully agree with Shannon. Okay, so we've got five minutes left. Okay, so five minutes. All right, so Mohammed. 
Well, in my opinion, I think uh, more and more procurement and supply chain management functions have shown the credibility and, and they are being appreciated by the management as to what they've been able to do. Um, like Carmen mentioned, it's an opportunity. Um, we need to completely reposition ourselves internally in the organization to ensure that we can provide the information required for decision making, that we are showing results, we are quantifying our achievements, and not just about talking what we've been able to do, but the kind of value that we add to the PL of the organization at the end of the day. And the more we do this, the more the more the credibility comes in and recognition comes in automatically. Okay, brilliant. Two minutes, Shrub, two minutes, my friend. Tell me about 2021. Is it He's, he's frozen. Saeed? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I think we mentioned that uh, 2021 will be maybe will be wouldn't be in like 2020. Uh, it will be challenging. We'll be basically putting all the strategies we put we have put in 2020 and 2021. And uh, definitely it's going gonna, it's gonna to be challenging. We basically are going to stress test everything as a business from a customer, manufacturing sources. And we will meet each other uh, hopefully in the same time this next year. And then I'll, I'll let you know. That's great. And last but not least, my friend. Rob? Yes? Come on, my friend. Yeah. What are your predictions for 2021? I think definitely 2021 is going to be better because things have to improve and things will improve. And uh, as uh, Said said, we are all very hopeful and uh, there are good indicators in the market. Overall, the business environment is recuperating from the initial jerk it had. So in one year, one year time, same November next year, we'll rediscuss and uh, think what, what our predictions were good and what were wrong. Well, ladies and gentlemen, who's, who's been listening to the actual panel, um, it's for me, I've learned so much from the panel and I, hopefully you've actually taken some uh, away. I've been looking at the comments and, and thank you for the questions that you posted. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to every question, um, but there were some very good questions there. Um, I'd like to thank the panel. Um, they've been amazing and the, the knowledge sharing has been incredible. And we're all very busy with COVID and for you to take time out today to do this, that's very much appreciated to the SIPS community and, and thank you very much. The takeaways that we've got from this, from our, from our experts and senior leaders within procurement and supply chain in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, is that we, you know, we're critical enablers. Soft skills are so important now, vendor management, strategic thinking, adding value at the strategic point, you know, being a trusted internal business partner, resilience, and also, you know, we have a, a direct effect now on the p &L with the cost management side. So I'm just going to go and check the last couple of minutes or last minute or so to see if there are any last dying questions. I can't see any. Okay, restructuring of the supply chain integration. We've, we've talked about AI. Um, we've talked about the... Uh, the boom and challenge period of the medical and pharmaceutical industry. Um, I could talk to you about that for hours about the pharmaceutical industry. Um, there's quite a few, but no questions, just a few challenges that have come through. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, we're actually on time. So that is the end of, of the session. Um, it's now uh, 9.45. Um, and you'll be going to your next session. So enjoy the rest of the conference. And again, to the panelists, thank you all very, very much. Okay, you've been absolutely amazing. And the, the knowledge you've shared and the experience has it, been tremendous. And, I, and I've learned so much today as well. So everybody. Thank you very Kurt. much, Kurt. Thank you to everyone. Right. Thank you, Kurt. Thank, thank you, guys. Take care. God bless. Be safe. Bye.